So, um, are there other uh, 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 actions that your students have taken that were particularly are particularly memorable or, or, or were effective? We're measuring effectiveness, so we'll see. With yeah. the Jewelbug campaign, it, it's a it's a very neat little, very fun app, mm -hmm. and we the students all formed teams, and then they competed for how many points they could right. get. And you get points for taking a short shower. You yeah. get points for walking instead of yeah. taking a car. You get points for bringing a reusable mug instead mm -hmm. of buying a mug, things like that. So right. it's a, a, a way to cue you to the everyday actions mm -hmm. that you can take to make the world more sustainable, make mm -hmm. our community a more sustainable place, with the idea that you could change the culture of a place mm -hmm. to be one that's more cognizant and more sustainable. Uh, and one of the benefits of this partnership is that in Jewelbug and like all of these apps, right. it's all self-reported data. Yeah. So you have no idea if people are actually doing the things yeah. that they say yeah. they're going to do. But Wesleyan is a closed community. Mm -hmm. So we should be able to find out right. if people actually bought fewer mugs. That's right. Or yeah. used less water or whatever it is. So we're going to try to find out what, uh, to what extent those, those everyday actions actually took place and made a difference. Mm -hmm. Um, but there, uh, there's also fun things that we did. Uh, one of the years I taught it, it was a more open assignment of let's do something. Uh -huh. And they did an environmental art installation. Uh -huh. You may recall it. It was oh, uh, yes. made out in front of the student yeah. center and they took all of the trash yeah. generated over a single weekend of partying on the Wesleyan campus and constructed a guy called Wasted Man Wasted who was Man. made yes. out of these solo cup yes. things and he was wasted <laughs> in front of... <laughs> in yeah. front of the campus center, but it really made people realize, and there were some other things related to it, but it made, it made students brought home to them the fact that their, their party culture is very wasteful, yeah. that they could bring their own container right. to a party, right. and then you wouldn't have to have all these solo cups that are bought and yeah. consumed and usually not recycled, usually just thrown in the trash. So there are ways in which you can do things. I had a, we had a launch party for Joel Bug, uh -huh. and, uh, we tried to make it zero waste, and uh -huh. in fact, it was. Yeah. So we were able to compost all the pizza boxes. Yeah. I brought reusable plates for mm -hmm. everybody and reusable cups, and we recycled the soda bottles afterwards. So even though it was a party for 30, 40 people, right. there was zero waste afterwards. Everything got reused or recycled or composted. It's so interesting to me because, you know, a lot of people, if you stay at the macro level, you can feel overwhelmed by the issues. Uh, but at the micro level, there are so many things people can do. And when you start paying attention to what, the way you live and the, the little things you do to, that waste energy um, or that are, use resources unnecessarily, when you start paying attention, it's, you make immediate corrections, you know, and, and uh, it's like those hybrid cars where you see how much gas you're using seems to be, just knowing how much gas you're using seems to be the big, biggest incentive to save. I mean, that you, you become more aware um, and, and that, that triggers change. I, I, I think we see it in the United States in the, in the sustainable food movement too, you know, that when it started, it seemed like a very elitist foodie thing that people were just trying to, you know, find another way to differentiate themselves but over the last 15, 20 years, it's become a very significant economic and political force in local gardens and people uh, paying attention to their food in ways that have has affected big business, has affected supermarkets. And so little actions actually have this wonderfully rever reverberating effect in a positive direction, just like the little polluting actions we did had negative effects. Uh, any suggestions for the students uh, in a class like this where everybody's kind of tuning in online, um, how they might find their way to to other teams or organizations, and how does someone who is concerned about um, sustainability issues, how do they find other people <laughs> who are concerned about these issues? Well, it's uh, in this day and age, it's usually very, very easy to find other people who are concerned about the issues, and one of the things that was really uh, helpful about my research and also my class, like my class is organized actually around the idea that you finish the class and don't feel overwhelmed, but yeah. in fact you feel empowered. Like yeah. a goal of empowerment is actually a pedagogical goal that I have for the mm -hmm. class. And my research also found that it doesn't matter what political system you're in, it doesn't matter how rural you are, it doesn't matter how poor you are, it doesn't matter how rich you are, it doesn't matter who you are, where you live, or anything, you can make really positive and important changes. 
And one of the most effective things that I found, both in my research and then also in some large N analysis that I did, was making it work locally, is the mm -hmm. way that I sort of phrase yeah. it. Yeah. But essentially, if you can find a small thing in your own community and get it to work, yeah. it can magnify. So other communities follow you. Mm -hmm. They say, oh, wow, that's right. happening over there. That's a good idea. Right. If that magnifies enough, it can become national policy, sort of one of the great examples of success in this area also actually comes from China. It was a 20, it's called a 26 degree campaign. Uh -huh. It was started a few years ago and a couple of NGOs, just a handful, yeah. I think it was five, came up with the idea to try to get hotels and other large um, buildings mm -hmm. to keep their air conditioners set at 26 degrees. So that's 70 degrees or so uh -huh. rather than, oh, or maybe 75 degrees yeah. rather than, rather than uh, 70 degrees. Right. So the idea being we're only just getting air conditioning. Yeah. People are used to being hot in the summer right. because it's hot in right. the summer. And so it shouldn't be the case that you walk into a room and feel cold. Right. You should walk into a room and maybe not be quite as sweaty, right. but you don't have to be feel cold. Right. And if you could just keep that number higher, yeah. it makes a huge difference. So it worked. Yeah. So it worked in Beijing. It became city policy, it became national policy, and uh, the, they've got num very, very large numbers on carbon yeah. saving for that small thing. But even I've had students that went home for a break and started a get rid of plastic bag uh -huh. campaign uh -huh. on the main street right. in, their, in their town. And they went down and they either had a friend or they uh -huh. did it by themselves. And so they went to every single little outfit, outlet uh -huh. and gave them some information about why they shouldn't use plastic bags anymore and tried to generate some, some uh, energy around the idea of getting rid of plastic bags and many of them were successful. Yeah. Um, and some of them they weren't successful and then they learn from the things that they aren't successful in and either tweak their strategy for the thing that they're trying to accomplish or, or do something else yeah. that's a little bit uh, easier to accomplish that can, that can make some positive change. But there are a lot, there's a lot, the language and political science is low hanging fruit. Right. So yeah. there are a lot of ways, like the corporate savings things mm -hmm. that you talked about, where it's a win, win, win for everybody. Yeah. The corporation wins because they make money. The citizens win because they get safer, cleaner products. The planet wins, the politicians win, like yeah. everybody wins. And there are a lot of things that are in that category. There are a lot of things that are hard too, right. that pit fundamental interests of people mm -hmm. uh, in very difficult ways. And those are gonna be very, very challenging. But, but that's not an excuse for not dealing with the things we can do now. Exactly, and you can make a lot of headway on the things that we can do actually quite easily. As, mm -hmm. uh, as I think you know, I was in Tokyo at the time of the 311 disaster. Right. And so the, the, overnight we had this giant earthquake, the nuclear power plants were taken offline, there were massive energy savings. Everybody said there were gonna be brownouts and blackouts for the weekend. Everybody had to save energy. Uh, and there weren't any brownouts and there weren't any blackouts. Mm -hmm. And it's because everybody took the time to save energy. And Tokyo, one of the world's largest cities, right. you know, reduced its energy by 25% overnight. Yeah. If, we, if all the big cities in the world did that, mm -hmm. we would have no climate change problem. Right. And it wasn't a big deal. Yeah. You know, they took every third light bulb out yeah. and the subway station yeah. lights, the street lights, it was every third light bulb came yeah. out. People took the stairs instead of the elevators. The escalators were shut down. They, they turned off their super fancy, really nice toilet seats that uh -huh. warm up and spray yeah. things and <laughs> sing to you. And they right. just had normal ones that have yeah. a manual flush yeah. and that didn't take any, any electricity. So there's really tremendous change that can happen. And it was a stark contrast in the United States after yeah. Sandy, which happened right. almost right afterwards. Yes. And my husband went to work and he calls me up on his phone. He says, I can't believe it. My company is running on a generator and there are lights on in the parking lot mm -hmm. during the during day. The yeah. So no one was, no so one was there paying was, attention to those There just wasn't a sense of scaling mm -hmm. back mm -hmm. that there was, it, your, your lights were either on, all of your lights were on, or they were all off. Yeah. There wasn't a sense of actually, we can turn half of them on yeah. and still get things done and it's fine and, yeah. and you don't need think really hard about that upper edge, yeah. like what it is you don't really need. Yeah. 
Well, I think that one of the um, uh, exciting things about this kind of course, a MOOC like this, is that we have thousands of students around the world who can suggest to one another, here's what's working for me, here's what I've been doing, and then someone else can, can learn from that and build on it. And we can get really interesting synergies, I think. And also, someone could say, you know, this didn't work, why not? And so well, it won't be the professor, uh, but it will be other students, because there's so many of them that they can easily share information and, uh, and as you say, have a, have a sense of empowerment, because in, that's what this class uh, aims for as well, a sense of informed empowerment. And uh, thanks so much for getting together to talk about your work and your students' work and... Uh, and how we can make a difference. Thanks. I, in my research also, one of the strongest things was networking Yeah. and these networks. So it isn't just about, and this is very true in Asia as opposed to the United States where we have these organizations that are at their top, yeah. and they have sort of hierarchical, and they have a lot of money and they have a lot of resources and they kind of divvy it out. And in Asia, they don't have that. So yeah. the ordinary people like your, like your students who sort of email one another and they say, well, how about this? Well, I yeah. can do that in my town. And, and they try it at the same time. And oh my gosh, it worked. And now there are three towns that are doing it. Now there are 10 towns that are doing it. Now there are 20 towns that are doing it. Now there's five cities that are doing it. Now there are 10 countries that are doing it. And it, it's amazing what, with the technology now, this peer-to-peer -peer mm -hmm. sort of learning is very, very powerful. So it was, it was a pleasure. Thank you very much very for nice having me. You. Thank you. So we see that precipitation has increased in many parts of the world and decreased in other parts of the world. Um, drought has increased in most places, and this has been consistent with our expectations of uh, the planet getting, getting warmer. Um, and uh, interestingly, wet areas of the planet are getting wetter. And so um, what we see is an intense, as I said, an intensification of extremes. And that's why many people today talk less about uh, global warming and talk about climate change. And, and, and uh, it's really about extreme weather getting more hazardous and being more disruptive. You know, I think that's a, uh, uh, an important uh, uh, word to keep in mind. It's, it's, it's disrupting of ecosystems uh, the, on which we depend, on which thousands and thousands of species depend. Uh, and it is true that new species will evolve in relation to these changes. Um, uh, but um, our species actually uh, w will certainly not evolve quickly enough um, unless we change uh, the dynamic context in which we live. Uh, and one of the places we see this uh, peril is in uh, food production. The United Nations recently projected that up to one quarter of global food production could be lost by 2050 uh, due to the combined impact of climate change, land degradation, and water scar scarcity. One quarter of global food production. That's enormous. At the same time, a global population is expected to increase from 7 billion to about 9.5 billion by 2050. Now, what's important for us to note here is that, of course, some areas of the globe will be affected more than others. And, um, and, and this is, becomes a political issue when some parts of the globe are able to protect themselves against the worst effects of climate change, while other parts of the globe um, are going to be suffering uh, um, even more from changes in climate. Now, the ones who can protect themselves may also be the ones who've contributed most to these changes, um, the wealthiest nations uh, of the world. On my list of, of the uh, uh, six uh, factors, I think we're up to our number six now, which is uh, ocean uh, acidification. Uh, we find because of these changes that the level of acid in the oceans has increased um, by about 30%, uh, we think because of uh, the human contribution um, to uh, 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 carbon in the atmosphere. Um, this will affect and is affecting everything from coral reefs to shellfish and then to the entire um, a constellation of species uh, of fish uh, and, and, and plants uh, that depend on them. And you can see this very dramatically, uh, especially in coral reefs that are dying uh, that are, or are struggling uh, 
uh, because of the acidification uh, of oceans. So I've already talked to you about some of the reasons we should care about uh, climate change. I've tried to give you some of the basic facts from what the temperature changes will be to um, intensification of, of heat waves and drought and, um, and, and of extreme storms, which I haven't talked much about, but, but um, we see that uh, also as a pattern emerging in the world. Um, and uh, it sometimes feels remote. I mean, I can well, look at a picture of a glacier from my office here at Wesleyan in, in the central Connecticut, and I, I can see the power of the glacier uh, uh, melting into the ocean, but it, it may still feel remote to me. Um, I can read about droughts and, uh, or flooding, <clears throat> and it still can feel somewhat remote to me. But what's important for us to recognize is that everyone on the planet will have to cope with these changes over time. But it's also important to note that some people are already coping with them quite dramatically right now, that the most vulnerable people in the world will be most at risk from climate change, and that the social justice issues here are also very uh, important and have a moral and political claim on us, even if we feel at the moment that, we, uh, that these things are remote from our day-to-day -day lives. Uh, those living in poverty will be the first ones to suffer most from climate change. Uh, they are in the most vulnerable positions. Developed countries have put the most carbon into the atmosphere. They have contributed to the most, most to the poisoning of the planet. And they continue to do so. We continue to do so. But uh, as you'll see from some of the graphic information we'll present to you, uh, the developing world is now catching up uh, through its own path of industrialization. Um, uh, they, the developing world is is also massively putting more and more carbon into the atmosphere. Um, and so there is a political question of um, uh, the, the economic growth has been linked to carbon production. Right? Industrialization and carbon production go hand in hand. And so for, in the developing world, the cry is often heard that, hey, you guys in the industrialized world, you've been doing this for 100 years. Uh, and you're asking us to, 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 to uh, accelerate industrial production without using fossil fuels. That's impossible right now, or it's too expensive right now. And so you in the developed world should be paying a higher price for poisoning the planet because you've been doing it longer. And the developed world is, of course, protecting its, its wealth, protecting its advantages, and is reluctant to tax itself. But without some political will to curtail the use of fossil fuels in the development of economic uh, growth, everybody's going to suffer. And the most vulnerable uh, will suffer the most. So I'm recording this lecture uh, in uh, late November 2013, uh, not long after a massive typhoon um, hit the, the Philippines, um, uh, wrecking havoc uh, uh, in, uh, in uh, much of the country. But again, you see there, uh, as we've seen in other cases of extreme uh, uh, storms, that the most vulnerable are the ones uh, uh, that suffer the most. Let me quote from a, a World Bank report. No nation will be immune to the impacts of climate change. However, the distribution of impacts is likely to be inherently unequal and tilted against many of the world's poorest regions, which have the least economic, institutional, scientific, and technical ability uh, to react. And so what we see is that, is that poverty and climate change um, get intertwined. Um, and, um, and when we fight climate change, we are also fighting against poverty. When we fight uh, against extreme poverty, we also um, uh, are fighting against, um, uh, we should be fighting against climate change. In other words, economic growth um, uh, must be seen in the context of the dangers uh, of climate change. What can we do? Um, this is really the subject of uh, many of the videos we will be using or the, from the Social Good Summit. And uh, we have the, uh, uh, the, the benefit of, of uh, former Vice President Al Gore 
um, and many of the people he's worked with, uh, who will be talking to us uh, about the projects they've worked on to raise awareness about climate change, um, to reduce the demand for uh, energy produced by fossil fuels by conserving energy uh, uh, much more dramatically, coming up with policies to uh, put um, uh, uh, a pr appropriate price on the production of carbon so that we now know how to um, limit the use of carbon by making it clear that it's economically uh, less sustainable than anybody ever thought it was. Um, and, and as you look through these videos and as you search through these websites, uh, uh, I will ask you in our assignment to think about what kinds of actions we can take to raise awareness about climate change and create a greater awareness about sustainability.